Hello everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and it is Friday, so that means it's time for another MTG Top 10. I've been doing lots of keyword abilities on these videos lately, and so far I've done mechanics that are still around. Today, we're not looking at a mechanic that exists today, it doesn't exist at all anymore, but it was around all the way back in Legends, and stuck around until Scars of Mirrodin. It wasn't actually given the keyword ability Shroud until the end of Time Spiral block, but it had been around a long time before that, so there's a lot of eroded cards that have Shroud. This means this list is made up entirely of older cards. Shroud was sort of the precursor to Hexproof. It was primarily on blue and green cards, and it made it so that your opponent couldn't target your creature with things. It conveyed the same sort of thing flavor-wise too, elusiveness or the ability to repel magic. But there is one big difference between the two. You can't target your creature either. Shroud is completely symmetrical, so your opponent can't lightning bolt your creature with Shroud, but you can't cast Giant Growth on it either. Wizards opted to move towards Hexproof being a more long-term mechanic, mostly because it is all upside, which is better for new players. It doesn't give them sort of the feel-bads that Shroud can give you. For the most part, I think this is a good thing, but I wouldn't hate seeing Shroud on the occasional card, since it can sometimes be used to reel in the power level of a Hexproof creature. Don't want people to put auras on it? Give it Shroud, and it won't be as good as it would have been with Hexproof. Anyway, the point is, this video is going to focus on the now-extinct keyword ability, Shroud. In this video, I'm going to discuss the 10 cards with Shroud that did the most at the highest level of Magic Tournament play. Before we get started, a quick reminder on how I scored my top 10s. Cards receive points depending on how many Grand Prix or Pro Tour top 8s they have received, with a Pro Tour top 8 worth twice as much as a Grand Prix top 8. The cards in this list are then arranged numbers 10 through 1 with the most points at number 1. I also count Legacy and Vintage Championship events as Pro Tour top 8s, so those formats can be reflected in the scores of the cards. Now let's get started. At number 10, we have Multani, Morrow Sorcerer. This sorcerer is a callback to the older card, Morrow, which is actually a creature referencing Mark Rosewater, that has power and toughness equal to the cards in your hand. Multani has power and toughness equal to cards in all players' hands, and has Shroud, though, so it is considerably more powerful. That said, Multani was never a win condition that people just cast out of their hand, and it never saw any play in Standard. Instead, all of its points came in Reanimator decks in Extended that got Multani into play on turn 2 or 3. This included two mono-black Reanimator decks at Pro Tour in New Orleans in 2001, and a blue-black Reanimator deck at Pro Tour Houston in 2002. These decks just tried to mill or discard Multani, and then put it into play with various reanimation cards as early as turn 2, when it was quite large, too, because there's going to be more cards in people's hands on turn 2 than there is going to be in the later stage of the game. At number 9, we have Autumn Willow. The Willow is a 4-4 with Shroud, but it's an interesting one because it has Shroud that can basically be turned into Hexproof if you are willing to pay 1 green mana, so it gets around the downside most Shroud cards have, that even you couldn't target it. Certainly not an impressive card by today's standards, but back when it was printed in Homelands, having a 4-4 who couldn't die to removal was pretty good. Autumn Willow got all of her points at a single Pro Tour in 1996, Pro Tour New York. There she appeared in three different aggro decks, two green-white aggro decks, and a green-white-red aggro deck, where she could serve as a curve topper that was difficult to deal with. At number 8, we have Sphinx of Jwar Isle. It's the kind of card that control decks want to try to win with. Hard to remove thanks to Shroud, and it hits hard in the air. It also has the additional added value of allowing you a little bit more information, what the top card of your library is, while also not letting your opponent know what it is. It doesn't just reveal the card, you're the only one who can look at it. In Standard, it saw play in Mythic Bant and its successor Next Level Bant, which were decks that ran a ton of Mythic Rares, and that's where the name comes from. But it was mostly a creature-heavy deck that tried to ramp into big monsters using Birds of Paradise, Lotus Cobra and Noble Hierarch and Sphinx of Jwar Isle was one of the things the deck could ramp into. It also saw play in Mythic Conscription decks, a deck that tried to cheat Eldrazi Conscription into play. It managed one top 8 and extended at Grand Prix Oakland in 2010 in a deck called Thepths, which both ran the Vampire Hex Mage Dark Depths combo and the Sword of the Meek Thopter Foundry combo, and it provided another win condition for the deck in case those combos got broken up. Despite having a rather full resume, Sphinx of Dwar Isles did all of that from March to June of 2010 and hasn't picked up a point since then. It seems unlikely that it will see play in any of today's non-rotating formats. At number 7 we have Blurred Mongoose, whose blistering speed is reflected with the fact that it can't be countered in addition to also having Shroud. The Mongoose saw all of its play in Invasion Block Constructed, where it put up four top eights at Pro Tour Tokyo in 2001, and all of these decks were red-green aggro decks. Being immune to removal, like the very powerful Flame Tongue Kavu, also being able to just trade with the Kavu, was good in the format, and it came with a respectable body that could get in for some nice damage early. 
At number 6, we have Blastoderm. A 4-mana 5-5 five five with Shroud is powerful. Even today, that would be a pretty good card. And back in 2000, it was a super-pushed creature. The fading mechanic, though, allowed for this undercosted monster to exist, since it would effectively only be able to attack twice before fading away. Still, the size of this creature and the difficulty there was in killing it made it one of the strongest and most efficient cards around in the standard of its time. This guy, despite not being a rebel, even managed to find its way into a rebel deck that top aided the block pro tour in 2000, and that shows you just how powerful it is. In standard, though, he did the most work. These undercosted creatures with fading, with Blastoderm probably being the best of them, were most abused in a deck that ran Fires of Yavi Maya. If you give all of your fading creatures haste, the downside they had was reduced considerably because they were able to attack an additional time, so the fading didn't hurt for too much. And for a while, this was the best deck in standard, with six of the top eights that Blastoderm picked up in standard featuring Fires of Yavi Maya. After he rotated out of standard, Blastoderm hasn't done anything, and it is very unlikely ever will, but it was one of the defining cards in the standard of 2000 and 2001. At number 5, we have Giant Solifuge, who is packed full of keywords. In addition to Shroud, it also has Trample and Haste. This is a good creature for aggressive decks because it hits so hard and is difficult to kill. If your opponent has a 1-1 token who can block it, that's kind of annoying. But assuming you got to smash for 4 the first time when your opponent had their shields down and are trampling for 3 the second time, you feel pretty good about that. As an aggressive deck, doing 7 damage with 1 card is pretty reasonable, and that was frequently just what the Solifuge did. And additionally, if you backed it up with removal and your opponent just could not block it, it would just kill them eventually. It saw play in Ravnica block, getting four top eights at Pro Tour Charleston in 2006. Three of these were in aggro decks, and one of them was in a control deck. It was in the sideboard of the control deck, which had a very creature-heavy sideboard and could sight into a more aggressive deck if it needed to. In standard, its primary home was also aggro, including Gruul aggro, Zoo, and Boros aggro. It saw all of this play in a single year in 2006, though, and hasn't done anything since then. At number 4, we have Kodama of the North Tree, a big efficient creature with Trample and Shroud. This made it a frightening creature to have to deal with, and it appeared in a variety of decks as a win condition in both Block and Standard. This included Green-White Ramp and Heartbeat of Spring, which was a combo deck but ran Kodama in the sideboard, and various aggro decks including Snakes and Stompy. In Standard, its primary home was Gauzy Glare, a deck that ran Glare of Subduel to tap down the opponent's creatures. This deck used a mass of creature tokens to tap down the opponent's creatures, and doing this made it difficult for your opponent to kill Kodama in combat. It also had the upside of being good in the mirror, since the glare couldn't actually tap down your Kodama. At number 3, we have the only card in this list that is still actively seeing play, and that is Nimble Mongoose. This is probably the only list I'll ever do that has two mongooses on it, or mongeese, I don't know. But anyway, a 1-mana one 1-1 one -one with Shroud is nothing special, but if you get Threshold, it gets to be a 3-3. Three -three. Basically, every deck to run the Mongoose in any format was capable of quickly obtaining Threshold. Then, the deck could back it up with Bounce and Removal spells and just take the opponent down with the difficult to deal with 3-3 Mongoose, which you've only invested one mana in. So it's sort of almost a Delver of Secrecy in that it's a one mana 1-1 one -one that turns into a bigger creature. In block, this meant blue-green threshold decks, which got two top eights at Pro Tour Osaka in 2002. The only other format where the Mongoose sees play is where it continues to see play, and that is in Legacy. This includes various incarnations of threshold decks over the years, with the earliest versions being called Thresh Grow in 2005, and most recently called Canadian Threshold. It has its most recent top eight at a Grand Prix at Grand Prix Las Vegas earlier this year, and Canadian Threshold is clearly a tier one deck in Legacy that will continue to put up numbers, so Nimble Mongoose has a good shot at climbing up this list in the coming years. At number two, I have Morphling, one of the most iconic control deck win conditions of all time. Morphling is loaded with activated abilities. It can untap itself, gain flying, pump its power and toughness. It can also give itself Shroud, and that was a key element of the card, as it allowed you to effectively protect your win condition against your opponent's removal, while you continue to hit them hard with the Morphling. It first put up numbers at the Urza's Block Pro Tour 1999, with two top eights in control decks there. In standard, it only put up one top eight, but it was in a blue control deck at Worlds in 2000. It found its way into more extended decks than anything. This included decks like Psychotog, Mono Blue Control, and Blue Red Control, but also included some versions of Oath of Druids, which was a combo deck for the most part, but it did run a singleton Morphling to help you win the game if your combo got broken up. At number one, we have Scion of Una, a Fairy Lord. The Scion itself does not have Shroud, but it gives all your other fairy creatures Shroud, and it has Flash, so it can frequently act as a counterspell against removal targeting a fairy. Luckily for the Scion, Fairies was a tier 1 deck across multiple formats. This was because it was an aggro deck with lots of instant speed creatures like the Scion, and this allowed it to interact more than your normal aggro deck is allowed to do, and this is what made Fairies so good in so many different formats. Fairies were good in block, standard, extended, and modern, and Scion of Uno went along for the ride in all of those formats. 
If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button. In the comments, let me know what your favorite card with Shroud is and whether or not you think the Shroud keyword ability should return. If you want to make sure you catch my NTG Top 10s every Friday, don't forget to subscribe. Additionally, my Top 10s are sponsored by 5colorcombo.com. You can use my discount code NITZAHONE5 to get a 5% discount in their store. Thanks for watching.